let's imagine, just for a moment, that I'm going to give you £50,000. I said, I'm going to give you £50,000. What a lovely thought. And I wonder what you would do with that um, unexpected windfall. Would you, for example, invest it in some stocks and shares? Uh, you might decide you want to donate it to your favourite charity. Um, perhaps it's uh, that uh, favourite long-cherished uh, sports car that you would uh, have your mind set on, or a studio in the garden, uh, perhaps a conservatory alongside. Someone in this room, possibly two or three people, student or parent, will be thinking, no, I'm going to spend my £50,000 on going to try and climb Mount Everest. <laughs> Now, that may seem like an impossible dream, but it's a dream that many people share. When I was about 11, 12 years old, I first started reading books about Mount Everest, and that's where my journey began. And I am certain that there will be people in this room who share a similar dream. Uh, whether it's a, a fantasy or not, it's there. The mountain uh, has an incredible, all-encompassing power. So Everest, these days, is for sale. If you did have that 50,000 pounds, you could go online, uh, look up the many mountain adventure companies that actually run trips to Everest, and you could sign up and, and you could do the training, you could uh, sort out the equipment, and you could find yourself sometime next year, probably in March or April, uh, moving out to Everest Base Camp and starting a great adventure. What would you find? Well, many people would argue that what you would find is a mountain that is broken a mountain that is bust, a mountain that is uh, despoiled by human beings and our activities. Why would they say that? Well, from what I've seen, in many ways, they are right. There is a lot of rubbish on Mount Everest, not just in the base camp region, but actually in the, uh, all the way up the mountain in the various camps where people stay. It's true to say that for the local people, Everest does offer an opportunity and a great deal of economic growth and prosperity has been uh, basically brought into the Everest region through climbers and trekkers and mountaineers. But the truth is that that comes and has always come at a very high price in terms of loss of life and injury to those very people who are working alongside the expeditions. So again, too high a price there. And then we think about the recent developments which have been uh, portrayed in the press around the world just this year. And I'm talking about pictures of the Summit Ridge. Now, I'm very privileged and fortunate to have taken those final steps onto the summit of Mount Everest, and there was no one around. In fact, there was nobody on the mountain uh, for, the, for the entire day when I reached the summit with my four companions. So, uh, in the last 20 years, a lot has changed, and one of the main things that's, that has changed is that there are many more people going. So with your £50,000 ticket, as you arrive at base camp, you may look around in, with a sense of, of frustration and, and perhaps uh, a little bit of regret as you see just how many people are camped on the glacier around you. Hundreds upon hundreds of people share that same dream to take those final steps onto the summit of the mountain. Now, uh, experts who look at Everest and who know the mountain intimately are really focusing on one thing at the moment and it's to do with that picture that we've all seen in the press of the crowds of, of people going along that summit ridge. The thing is this, what if the, the, somebody got sick in that lineup? What if somebody had a, 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 an epic or a drama and something went badly wrong? Then you would actually have somewhere between 70 and 100 mountaineers snaking along that summit ridge with nowhere to go because it is a knife edge ridge and there's only one, one person can go along at, 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 at a various time. And so there's a, a serious danger there because we are looking at a situation where in excess of 50 people could very quickly go down with hypothermia, with frostbite, and their oxygen, crucially, would start to run out, the supplementary oxygen that you use to climb Mount Everest. So we're looking at an exceptionally dangerous situation. As, and as somebody who's been on Everest three times, uh, I would say that it, that is the main danger at the moment. We're looking at a potential wipeout on the summit ridge uh, in the next few years if something is not done. So we have to ask ourselves the question, what can be done? What can we do? And uh, that's the, the, the theme I wanted to address here today. Now, if we look at Everest and we, when we look at how it began, Everest has never been a simple place. It's always been complicated. And uh, if we look at how the, the mountain was first named, for example, it was discovered and then subsequently named by the Survey of India. 
and in the 1840s they, they gradually made their way north uh, with this massive great big theodolite which weighed about 150 kilos. It was a, a phenomenal feat of, of um, ingenuity and also of planning and logistics and strength, but they managed to triangulate their way up the, the, the subcontinent of India all the way to the, the borders of Nepal uh, into which they could not step at that stage politically. But they could see Mount Everest on the, on the, the horizon in the distance and they figured out finally after a little bit of toing and froing that it was in fact the highest mountain in the world. But was it simple? No, it wasn't because then they had to work out what was the name of this mountain. And of course, uh, that was where um, geopolitics and the imperial designs of the East India Company came into it because they named it after Sir George Everest, who was the leader of that survey. And they didn't give it the local names, Chomolongma, Sagamartha, which for eons, hundreds of years, if not thousands, had been the actual names that the local people had had, had for this mighty symbol of nature. So things were pretty complicated right from the start. We fast forward to the 1920s and the very first efforts to truly climb the mountain start to kick off. Again, there's a sense of, of British entitlement that it's a, a British mountain Everest uh, and we, we are the ones that should climb it. And so the Royal Geographical Society sent out many expeditions to pre predominantly the north side of, of Everest, the Tibetan side, and something very interesting happened in the very first encounters that those mountaineers had with the local people who were living on the plateau of Tibet. And what happened was this. The Lama of the Rongbuk Monastery warned one of the first expeditions, and he said, if you go on the mountain, the mountain is the home of the gods, and human beings do not belong, and you will encounter disaster. So, so please do not go, and he begged them not to go. Well, they ignored his advice. They did go to the mountain, and on that very expedition, seven of their local Sherpa assistants, high-altitude porters, were killed in an avalanche. So it did indeed prove to be a disastrous expedition in, in a very terrible way. So things were already getting complicated there. We fast forward to the deaths of Mallory and Irvin, George Mallory, Andrew Irvin, two pioneers who in, uh, dressed in hobnail boots and with uh, tweed jackets. I mean, to me as a mountaineer, it's extraordinary and truly incredible that that was what they did and that was how they did it. Uh, it's it's, it's, it's in, inconceivable with our modern lightweight Gore-Tex and down equipment to think about what they did. And they got within an ace of the summit itself. And possibly, some people believe that they may have actually reached the summit, but sadly, they never got back down. Mallory and Irvin were lost in 1924, uh, making their way back down the north face. Fast forward to the 50s. Things are hotting up. The French are having a go. The Swiss are having a go. And the British are back. And it's still complicated because there's this, still this sense of national entitlement. We want to put our, 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 our flag on the summit of this mountain. And, uh, and we want to be the first. And so when the, the British expedition led by George Hunt did that, um, there was a sense of, is, is that game over? Will anyone ever go back to Everest? Some spectators said, well, what's the point in climbing it again? And you have to ask yourself the question, what is the point in climbing a mountain for the second time, or third, or hundredth, or thousandth time? So um, at that point, Everest had a bit of a breather, and then by the 70s, 80s, uh, the Chinese were climbing the north side, American first ascent, British first ascent, uh, with a British climber rather than a, a, a New Zealand climber, as in Edmund Hillary. And then we look at the key point, which was when the commercialization of Everest happened. And that was when the mountain became for sale. And then you had a, a very different scenario, because you had relatively inexperienced people going to Mount Everest and attempting to reach the summit and uh, you could buy your way onto a trip. And you can still buy your way onto a trip, and it's m cheaper and cheaper to buy your way on a trip in, re in, in uh, relative terms. And you can turn up in Kathmandu, and there are companies that will take you, not with no questions asked about your mountaineering experience, but very few questions indeed. So we're looking at a situation where the stress is rising. There have been fights on the mountain. Um, the rubbish levels are going up. The local people are beginning to say, enough is enough, our mountain is sacred, please leave it to rest. And many spectators have said, Everest should be closed or we're going to have this big disaster on the summit ridge. Now, personally, I don't think it's desirable or even possible to close Mount Everest. I think it belongs to the, uh, to the world. And I've met at Everest Base Camp in the last few years. Um, 
female climbers from Iran attempting to, to climb the mountain. Uh, climbers from uh, Colombia in South America. I've met Malaysians. I've met people from all around the world. It's a global community. We don't want to lose that. But at the same time, we do need, I believe, a code of conduct to try to treat the mountain with respect. That seems to me to be the key thing that we need at this point, is agreement by the expedition operators to do that. And one final thing. My thought on the business of that summit ridge up there. I think we need a lottery on the, the summit days. If you look at the Pacific Crest Trail, if you look at Yosemite National Park, if you look at the Colorado River as it goes through the Grand Canyon, you can't just turn up and do those things. You have to get a permit, and you have to apply for that permit and get it on the basis of a lottery, and you are informed, yes, you can go on such and such a date to do those out, um, out, outside adventures, and that's the, the way it works. And I, I, I think there's something in this. Let's have a look at a system whereby the summit days on Everest are governed by a similar system. And then if you've got 20 teams as, are trying to climb Mount Everest in an average season, you know, you're not gonna get a situation where 20 of those teams are all gonna try to go to the top on the, the same day. That's the fundamental problem. Uh, and we can parcel it up and have four teams a day or five going up on those available windows of opportunity. I think, I think it's workable and I think it can happen. I had a great experience on Everest. Everest has always been a, a wonderful and enriching and stimulating part of my life. Uh, I now see my own children starting to look in that direction, and I'm absolutely certain that there are pupils in this room who, who given a chance, would actually do the same. Let's hope that the mountain that you find is as beautiful and serene and untouched as it's always been. Thank you very much.